The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, National Headache Foundation uh, webinar. We have uh, Dr. Jeff Unger here. Uh, before I let him talk, before uh, he presents, I'm just going to give uh, a quick introduction. Uh, Dr. Unger is a board-certified family physician. He directs the Unger Primary Care Concierge Medical Group and Catalina Research Institute in Rancho Cucamongo, California. He's authored two medical textbooks on diabetes and another on migraine headaches. He's an associate editor of the Journal of Family Practice and has published over 190 peer-reviewed manuscripts on diabetes and pain, pain management. And with that, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Unger and uh, get ready for his presentation on migraine. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, offering me this opportunity to speak to, to patients that have migraine. Uh, I'm often asked, uh, why is a diabetologist, a specialist in diabetes, giving a migraine talk? Well, it turns out I had no choice uh, because in my family, everybody has migraine, all my kids, my wife. So the problem is if I can't fix the migraines, I don't get fed. So it's very important for me to do this the right way, and I've learned through the years on, on how to really uh, affect uh, migraine headache. Uh, the other interesting thing is I have a daughter in the uh, music industry, and when she was much younger, we used to go to auditions. Uh, and part of the audition process was to uh, – uh, fill out these forms, these questionnaires. Basically, they want to know what you do really good. And I have no talent at all. I, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't do anything. Uh, however, I filled the forms out just to aggravate my daughter, who was probably 15 or 16 at the time. And I would always write, I could stop a migraine headache in 10 seconds. Well, guess who got the call back? Me. Uh, I always did. That got her even more upset with me, but she's done very well since then. I will show you how we're going to stop a migraine in 15 seconds moving on towards the end of the talk here. So it's something to look forward to. So we're going to be talking about migraine today. And migraine is just a very disabling disorder. Even the World Health Organization understands this. And all of you out there that do have migraines, you understand how difficult it is to, to really even subsist with migraines. Migraines typically last about three or four days, sometimes getting up to five days. Even if you have four migraine events per month, that's 20 days a month that you're essentially disabled. That causes a lot of problems with your work. It's hard to hold a job. And the other problem is, the interesting thing that I, I know, that migraineurs are very, very intelligent. They're type A personalities. They want to work. But they're very, it's very hard to do that when you have this pain, when you have uh, loss of cognition, which is understanding things. You can have some blurred vision. You can have nausea. Yet, your employer is asking you to, to function just as normally as you possibly can. It becomes very difficult. Uh, there's been a lot of studies looking at the disability factor in migraine. We know that 53% of the people that have migraine have severe impairment, meaning that they need bed rest. Only about 9% of people that have migraine can function normally, but about 40% of patients have some degree of impairment. And I would say that the majority of these patients have severe impairment where they really cannot function they can't think clearly, uh, and they cannot do their job at the level that they're uh, employed to do so. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that have headaches. So we know that uh, if you look at prevalence ratios, uh, men have, about, uh, have, have headaches very frequently. 93% of all men have had at least one headache in their life, and 99% of all women have had at least one headache in their life. The majority of these uh, women, by the way, are married. Uh, among men, uh, the, the ratio of uh, uh, men that do not have migraine to those that have migraine is about one to three in relation to women. In other words, for every one man that has migraines, three women have migraines as well. Migraine can occur at any age. Uh, we have uh, little children, uh, three months of age, they have migraine. Uh, we know that they have migraine, their parents have migraine, and these uh, children often present with uh, nausea and vomiting repetitively. And when we treat them with uh, meds for uh, migraine, even at that age, the nausea tends to stop and the vomiting stops as well. And my oldest migraineur is uh, now 86 years old. She has uh, one or two headaches per month. So this is a chronic disabling disease. It does not go away. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no way that I can cure migraines. But what we can do is uh, teach you how to live amongst your very sensitive nervous system, which we'll discuss uh, moving on here. So migraine is a very disabling headache. That's the best way I can explain it. Any headache which is disabling should be considered migraine. It's intermittent because in between migraine attacks, the patient is doing just fine. When the migraine attack occurs, the patient becomes disabled. 
Migraineurs are born also with a very sensitive nervous system. This is genetic in nature. So if you have a, a mother or a father with migraine, there's a very good chance that you too will have these disabling headaches. What happens here is that migraineurs are born with a very sensitive nervous system. Now let me explain that. Very simple. I can cause a headache in anybody. All I can do is uh, take somebody like the moderator, Eric, hit him over the head as hard as I can with the baseball bat. He will have bad headaches. He's going to have uh, uh, sharp, dull, burning, stabbing type pains over one side of the head, depending on where I hit him. He's going to have nausea. He's going to have vomiting. He's going to have light sensitivity as well. But the thing is, I just hit him overhead with the baseball bat, so I would expect a disabling migraine. So migraineurs are a little bit different. They, too, have a lot of sensitivity. But the, the problem is that their brains are just oversensitive. So um, in this situation, if you if you have if you're on your period, you drink a little red wine, if you eat too much, if you eat not enough, if you skip a meal, if you don't get enough sleep, anything could trigger, trigger migraine. I don't need a baseball bat to trigger migraine in a migraineur. So the goal of managing migraine is to reduce this neurological sensitivity that the person is genetically enhanced with. So. Uh, Migraineurs, as I said, are born with a very sensitive nervous system. We do know the cause of migraine. It is not due to uh, enlargement of the blood vessels or shrinking of the blood vessels. It is a neurological process. This is important to know because a lot of times migraineurs want to have an MRI done on their brain. There's got to be something structural there. In reality, that doesn't happen. So migraineurs uh, are born with a sensitive nervous system. There are no structural abnormalities, and certain triggers uh, turn on this migraine. There's also five different stages, uh, well-documented, of migraine, and we're going to be talking about uh, all these stages because I think it's important to know. There's a prodrome that usually precedes a migraine for uh, up to 24 hours, and about 85% of patients develop this prodrome. And the importance of knowing if you have a prodrome is if you have one, you could actually treat, intervene at that point in time so the migraine doesn't, uh, doesn't progress. Uh, about 15% of all patients have an aura which is light sensitivity. There could be uh, uh, flashing lights or wavy lines. Uh, some people actually have uh, blurred vision or lose their vision completely. There's a very interesting uh, case in New Mexico about 15 years ago that I like to bring up that, that kind of illustrates this. Uh, this was an, a Native American who was driving home uh, at night, and he uh, crossed the center divider uh, after leaving a bar where he drank uh, quite a bit of beer, and he hit a, another car head on and killed I believe it was five passengers inside, all members of one family. So the district attorney says, we got, we're going we're gonna to lock this guy up for good. That's it. He's drunk. Uh, and uh, we know that's the case, and that's, that's, that's the end of the story. But it wasn't the end of the story. Apparently what happened uh, was that the patient, yeah, he was drinking, but he also experienced a visual aura. He was a migraineur, and the alcohol actually triggered the aura. So he said when he was driving home, uh, all of a sudden, he lost vision in both eyes, and that's when he crossed the uh, center divider and hit the other car. Well, he got off. The jury let him off, and the, the town was furious with this. But the fact is, there are a lot of triggers out there that can cause this aura and make life very, very hazardous. This is why we need to identify patients with aura and see if we can reduce the risk of getting the aura. The other thing that happens with aura, especially in women, there's a much higher risk of stroke if the person uses birth control pills and or smokes. So smoking has no role in the management of, uh, of uh, migraine. Then we go on to the headache phase. The headache phase can last anywhere between 24 and 72 hours. In children, uh, the headache phase can last a lot less, probably just four hours. It's a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to really time the treatment of uh, interventions for pediatric patients, but uh, we can do that. We can uh, prevent the headaches. And we can treat it acutely as well. They're just other rules that we play by. Then there's the postrome. The postrome uh, period occurs after the headache is gone. Patients feel that they're walking on eggshells. Any false move, anything that they do that could re-trigger the headache will. And then the resolution or the recovery of the headache follows, and the patient is uh, pain-free for a number of days. So these are the phases of uh, migraine attack as well. Uh, and during the prodrome, patients get very specific symptoms. And these symptoms include uh, food cravings, mood changes, yawning, cold hands. They can become irritable. Uh, a lot of times women uh, really become euphoric 
they feel really good and they go out and shop and spend a lot of money. That's when the wife, then that's when the husband comes home and said, "You spent what on where?" Uh, so uh, the, the people tend to to have a reduction in appetite occasionally, but then they eat a lot of junk food as well. They have sugar cravings, so they eat like a gallon of ice cream, but they'll have nothing else. And this occurs during the prodrome. I already talked about the aura, and we're going to have a patient describe that momentarily. The headache phase. During the headache phase, they become sensitive to light and sounds. They can have nausea, vomiting, uh, and if the headache persists for a long period of time, you could have actually pain outside of the brain. So you could have pain in your leg, pain in your arm, even pain in your ovaries associated with the headache. So I'm going to play this video here of a patient that is describing her prodrome. Uh, this occurs in a lot of patients. It's very important to know if you have a prodrome, because if you do, the way we uh, suggest treating it is with a couple of alleles. If you take the alleles, the most often the uh, headache will not reoccur or occur the following day. What was your last uh, really severe disabling sick headache? Five to eight minutes. Now, let's, let's talk about four days ago. Uh, you remember four days ago? Yeah, and can you tell me, were you... Uh, Feeling kind of moody on that day? Be you irritable? Be you anxious? Be you um, yawning? Be your hands cold? Uh, were you having a hard time thinking? Uh, were people saying to you, "What's what's up? You're not all there." Uh, tell me, uh, you didn't have much of an appetite, did you? But uh, you mentioned that you were um, kind of uh, snacking. What kind of stuff were you eating? Uh, did you eat? A, did you really enjoy that snack once you got into it? No, I just had a little snack. I didn't even cut off. I just like opened it, had a little bite in it. But the bottom line is that you know that something went right. You're feeling kind of out of sorts. Now, if you were to guess, would you would you say it, it's pretty safe to say that most of the time before you get one of your really bad headaches, you feel the same way about 24 hours before you get one of these headaches? All right, so that's a lady clearly describing a prodrome. Uh, we had her take a couple of leaves uh, uh, when she got the next prodrome, and it aborted the headache right then and there. Here's a patient describing an aura. And notice what happens when she starts talking. This is very common. She starts using her hands to describe what she sees. It's really important to figure out what type of aura these uh, patients have. We can't really uh, abort the headache at the time of the aura, but they know that they're going to get a headache and there are certain things that they can do immediately after the onset of the headache, which I'll show you coming up. So there's also a very interesting uh, phenomenon that occurs in people that have uh, headaches, and a lot of them think that they have just neck pain. They, they can have tension headaches or they can have uh, uh, the, the neck injuries. Some people come in and say they, they have a, a herniated disc. But in fact, 75% of all migraine occurs in the neck. And there's three branches of the nerve that is responsible for headaches. It's called the trigeminal nerve. The third branch of that nerve uh, goes to the neck. So when you have activation of the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, then you're going to get neck pain as well. So if you're constantly rubbing your neck, it could mean that this is actually migraine. Uh, then there's a process that occurs uh, after uh, having these headaches and not having the headache treated uh, acutely. If the headache lasts for more than four hours, people get allodynia, uh, which means that this is a painful response to a non-painful stimulus. So again, a non-painful, uh, I'm sorry, a painful response to a non-painful stimulus. So let me give you an idea of allodynia before I talk about headaches. I think everybody on the line here, I, 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 I checked, has had a bad sunburn. The sunburn is not allodynia, it's just pain. However, if you go home and you take a shower and the water hits the skin, that's allodynia. The, the skin hurts. And the water is not supposed to hurt the skin, but it does because the nerves are sensitive. So that's what happens to people that have prolonged migraine. They get this allodynia, everything hurts. Combing their hair hurts, shaving hurts, moving the head back and forth hurts, lifting, pushing, pulling, bending wearing a hat, putting on sunglasses, 
even putting on clothes, all of this hurts because the brain is highly sensitized at this time. And the problem is once you get to the stage of aldinia, it's really tough to fix migraines. As you'll see, we want to fix migraine before you get to the stage of aldinia because these people get really, really sick. So let me show you a little video here about what happens in migraine, why people get migraine. It's a nice little video, and I'm going to stop and start it. So what happens here is that you have a wave, what we call uh, cortical spreading depression. It goes from the back of the brain forward. And you remember that lady that had the aura? She said she had white spots and dark spots. So this is a wave of positive, positive cortical spreading depression. At this point in time, the patient's probably having an aura with white spots. But this is negativity. So as this moves forward, you're going to see white spots changing to black spots. What this wave of spreading cortical depression is doing is turning on or activating the trigeminal nerve. Now, what I mean by activation is, let's just say you walk through a room, it's dark. You find the light switch, you turn on the switch, and now the room is activated with light. It's the same thing with migraine. We are activating the trigeminal nerve. And what activates the nerve are certain chemicals we call neurokinins, neurotransmitters, and this is it going forward. Here's the wave of cortical spreading depression. You see the white spots first, then the dark spots that follow. Some people don't have aura, so not everybody's going to have this particular picture. But as it moves, as this wave moves forward at a specific rate of speed, this is the trigeminal nerve over here, and it's wrapped around the meningeal artery. So what's going to happen is that there's a release of chemicals. You can see them there, there the spots. Those are chemicals that's causing the uh, uh, meningeal artery to actually throb, get bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. And that hurts like a son of a gun. So when that occurs, there is what we call bidirectional flow. So the impulse, this is the trigeminal nerve. This is the first branch over here. This, this goes to the top of the head. This is the second branch. It goes to guess where? The sinus area. So if you think you have sinus headaches, you probably don't. It's most likely migraine. And then this is the third branch over here that goes to the neck. So you can have activation of one, two, three, or all three of these areas. So when it's activated, there's an impulse that runs backwards into an area which is called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. So, so the TNC takes this impulse, you'll see it come up here, and if the impulse goes down into the lower part of the brain, called the superior salivatory nucleus, guess what's going to happen? You're going to puke. If the impulse goes up, you're going to get pain. So once the impulse goes to the top of the brain, this is called the cortex, you're going to feel a lot of discomfort. And this is what we also call central sensitization. Around this time, the patient has this allodynia. Everything hurts. Nothing feels good. Uh, the patient is essentially disabled due to this pain. There's an area in here, you can't really see it very well with this picture, uh, but it's called the PAG, or the uh, uh, periodic ductal gray. So in order to turn off this headache, the brain has to send an impulse right over here to the periodic ductal gray, which shuts off the migraine, everything starts going away. Now, I know that you've experienced this PAG before. If you've ever stubbed your toe, you stub your toe, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt right away. It kind of comes on in a, a, a millisecond. You know it's going to hurt like crazy, and then the pain starts going away in about three seconds. That's the periodontal Dr. Gray talking. The problem with the PAG is that if you have lots and lots of headaches, there could be structural changes in this area called the PAG, and that makes the headaches even worse. So that's what causes uh, all these migraines. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a genetic issue. It also has to do with uh, spreading cortical depression. It has to do with the ability of the brain to turn off migraine. So there's a lot of different factors here that are important in figuring out uh, the cause of the treatment of migraine. So what is migraine? According to the rules, you have to have one side that's affected. It should be pulsating. It should be moderate to severe in intensity. It's worse with movement. There could be light and sound sensitivity, and there could be nausea and or vomiting. So three things that we really look at uh, in, in our practice when we're trying to diagnose uh, migraine is, number one, is the headache disabling? Can you go to school? Can you go to work with the headache? Number two, have you had any light sensitivity uh, with any of these headaches? If you have, that's, that's a positive indicator of migraine. And number three, uh, are you nauseated? If all three of these show up in your uh, personal experience, most likely you have migraine. Uh, so I showed you that trigeminal nerve before. Here it is again. This is the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. goes to the forehead. 
This is the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, and this goes into the base where the sinuses are located. So a lot of times patients think they just have sinus infection. So what does the doctor do? Uh, if, if a patient says, you know, I got sinus infections, well, let me give you an antibiotic, and guess how long it takes to work? About two to three days. That's how long a migraine lasts. So the patient says, aha, it must have been a sinus infection because this antibiotic uh, caused a, uh, uh, the, the headache to stop, sinuses are clear now. And then a week later, guess what happens? The headache comes again and again and again. So you're always going to have sinus inflammation, and you're always going to be treated with uh, antibiotics. The problem is that these are not sinus headaches. It's activation of the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. So these are, for those of you that think you might have sinus infections, let's check it out. In order to have sinus infections, you have to have a yellow or green uh, uh, mucus discharge from your nose. You have to have nasal congestion or obstruction. There has to be fullness in the face as well. There has to be pain, a little bit of facial pain and pressure. Uh, very important, you have to have loss of taste or smell. Some people have bad breath as well. And you should have uh, fever uh, with acute sinusitis. There's some minor issues as well, but the minor issues include headache. So yeah, sometimes you get a little bit of a headache, but it's not always bad. There could be some ear pain as well, cough, so forth. This is an interesting picture. This is a guy that we took a picture of that claimed he had uh, uh, really bad sinus headaches. And he was complaining of pain on this side, to so the left side. This shows an, what we call an air fluid level in the right maxillary sinus. He was asymptomatic there. He had no idea that was there. He was having pain in this area, and in fact, uh, he was having really bad migraine headaches. So for those of you that are non-believers, uh, this is a study that was done by Kurt Schreiber. Uh, very interesting. This is what the nose looks like. This is the middle turbinate right over here. This is the nose uh, looking in. And this isn't a patient that comes in with self-diagnosed sinus headaches. You can see that there's a big space between here and here. And now what he did was he had the patient return when they had their headache. So when they thought they had a sinus headache, they show up. And you can see what happens here. There's inflammation in the nasal passages. There's this clear discharge. It's not green. It's not yellow. The terminate is a little bit swollen over here. And then what Dr. Schreiber did was he gave them an injection of Imitrex which is an acute medication for the treatment of migraine. Uh, Imitrex does not work, or sumatriptan does not work in patients that don't have migraine headaches. It does absolutely nothing, and it's also injectable. So then he took another picture, and you can see that in this case, the air, uh, airway is increasing in size, the, the turbinate is actually decreasing in size as well, and the discharge has gone away within about a half an hour of uh, getting the Imitrex. So these are patients that think they have mig uh, think they have uh, sinus headaches, but in fact they they actually have uh, migraine. So how do we treat all this? There are many different therapies. There's acute therapies. How do we knock it out right now? Uh, there's a drug that we can use to uh, preempt the uh, uh, the headache. That is prevention. And there's also ways that we can treat this. Uh, what we call uh, abortive therapy. Uh, so in, in that situation, if nothing else works. This is what we can do. We're going to show you some of these options. But first, the most important thing for migraineurs is to deal with the behavioral intervention. Migraineurs uh, are very smart people, but for the most part, they might be doing something wrong behaviorally which could trigger their neurological sensitivity. For example, migraineurs frequently skip breakfast. They wake up, they're not hungry, they don't eat breakfast, and we know that starvation is a known trigger for migraines. So we have to eat three meals a day. There's no answers about it, about no answers or buts about it. When God created migraineurs, He created uh, a very significant neurological sensitivity. People have to eat. They should exercise. Migraineurs should exercise at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week. It makes sense. Some of the meds that we use to prevent migraine can cause weight gain, but weight gain is minimal if people exercise. Sleep hygiene is also very critical. There are some people I cannot fix. Uh, these are the people that working are working alternate shifts. They can work the night shifts one uh, one week, then go to day shift, night, day, graveyard, all over the place. There's no way the brain can function at that level. That actually causes migraines. So migraineurs need to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time seven days a week. On the weekends, you could actually sleep in. Let's say that you get up normally at 5 in the morning go to work. Well, at 5 in the morning on the weekends, what you need to do is wake up at 5, get out of bed, walk around the house for about uh, 10 minutes, drink some more juice, go back to bed, you can sleep all day. Otherwise, you get hangover headaches. And hangover headaches mean 
hangover from just sleeping in too much. Longinors need at least eight hours of uninterrupted sleep per night. Uh, if you had a teenager that was 12 years old, you would not allow him or her to just get three hours of sleep a night. And migraineurs can't. They need at least seven, eight hours a night uh, in, in order to uh, prevent this neurological sensitivity. Avoiding triggers is tough. Uh, for, but if you know that every time you drink cheap red wine, you get a headache, don't do it. If every time you know uh, that you travel, you're going to get a headache, just uh, there are some things that you can do to kind of suppress that migraine in advance of the actual attack. We need to stop smoking. Smoking has no role in migraine. Smoking causes the release of something called thromboxane, which is a known trigger for migraine. The next one is really important. We cannot allow our migraineurs to treat themselves more than twice a week uh, with acute analgesics. So if you're using more than uh, 24 pills a month for, uh, for pain, or if you're treating yourself more than twice a month, I'm sorry, twice a week for headaches, you're going to get headaches. Uh, the headache medicine that you're taking, like Excedrin, Tylenol, all this can be uh, construed as causing really bad chronic migraine. We want to avoid uh, uh, reduce. We want to reduce our dose of caffeine as well. So the recommendation here is no more than two cups of coffee a day, 250 milligrams a day. That's two cups. Now I I know sometimes these cups are really big. If you go to like 7-Eleven and you want to buy coffee, you can buy that super mug that has about 12 cups of coffee in it. I'm talking about normal people here. Two cups of coffee a day is it. We know that excess caffeine can trigger uh, headaches, but also caffeine is a good drug that we can use to prevent headaches as well. So what we want to do is reduce the caffeine intake to two cups a day. If you're drinking four, five, six a day, the way you do it is you reduce the caffeine consumption by one cup per day per week down to two cups. Do not go below two because, as I said, caffeine is actually a good thing uh, for people that have migraine. Uh, also, have a written plan. That's, that's really critical as well because migraineurs, as you know, are very smart people. But give them a migraine and they cannot think. They can't function. So it's better to write it all down instead of trying to remember what the doctor said six weeks before. So our treatment goals are very simple. We, if you're going to get a headache, we want it gone in uh, two hours. We want you to be able to return to full function in two hours. We do not want the headache to reoccur. We want to get rid of the nausea and vomiting uh, that occurs as well. And we do not want you to use medications over and over and over again. We want to have targeted therapy to make you better. So there are certain triptans here. These are acute medications for migraine. I'm not going to go over all these, but I will tell you there are oral forms, there are injectable forms, there are intranasal forms, there are sublingual forms. There's something for everybody. There's also uh, treatments for uh, menstrual migraine as well. Uh, one of them that we use very frequently is fulvotriptan or nerotriptan. We give that a day before uh, the menstrual migraine is, uh, is uh, scheduled to occur, and they can be pain-free throughout their menstrual cycle. The injectable drugs work very quickly, as opposed to the oral agents, which tend to work uh, over about a two-hour period of time. It's really important for migraineurs to treat their headache acutely and rapidly, because we know from this study, it's called the Spectrum Study from Roger Cady, that if you treat during the mild phase of the attack, 80% are better within two hours. However, if you wait for six hours, then you're going to be in deep trouble. Uh, and and uh, the headache may not go away for several days. We've got that period of time before the brain gets sensitized. You saw that, that video that I showed you before. We want to make you better quicker. So as soon as the migraine comes, you treat. Keep in mind that for the majority of the people on this call, they have migraine headaches. They don't have brain tumors. They don't have cluster headaches. They don't have tension headaches. They do not have sinus headaches. They have migraine. If in doubt, treat and treat early. Uh, when do you consider preventative therapies? Well, anybody can be a preventative candidate. Uh, we have a brain surgeon that I take care of uh, that has really bad auras, but only once every three months. So you would not want him uh, operating on your brain when all of a sudden he can't see. So we have him on uh, medications that prevent those headaches, and he's doing very, very well. There are some people that have very severe headaches periodically. These people have the right to have preventative medicine. Uh, you may remember uh, uh, about seven years ago when uh, Denver was in the Super Bowl, uh, and uh, there was this guy named Terrell Davis. And Terrell Davis uh, was a running back for the uh, Denver Broncos, very good running back. He had severe migraines. So if you have a pro athlete, you're going to have to consider 
using some type of preventive medicine because if you don't, he's not going to be able to play and you're not going to be able to win the Super Bowl. There are drugs for everybody. We have drugs for heavy people, thin people, beautiful people, not so beautiful people, elderly, young people. We have athlete drugs. But the thing is that everybody is treated individually, and there are many, many options. <clears throat> One of the drugs that we like to use quite a bit of is something called topiramate, uh, which is actually a seizure medicine, but it's also FDA approved for chronic migraine. Uh, and uh, most uh, doctors that deal with migraine are very uh, good at using to topiramate. There are some side effects to it, the most common being that it could affect your memory. There could also be some numbness in your fingers when you take this. But I always tell my patients, don't call me if you're tingling. That's just the way the drug works. Uh, there are other drugs as well uh, that are herbal medicines that I think are kind of interesting. Now, when we deal with the pediatric population, we like to use these because mothers don't like putting, uh, I guess, strong medicines in their children's bodies. So my favorite here is magnesium. Uh, it's magnesium oxide. It's got to be oxide. It's 400 milligrams. You take it at bedtime. And magnesium, the way it works is it decreases the brain sensitivity to outside triggers. So you actually put like a, uh, a, um, uh, a foil wrap around the brain so that the brain does not become sensitized by lack of sleep, too much sleep, eating the wrong food, and so forth. There's also feverfew, uh, which uh, is uh, dried leaves. You take three of these daily. Uh, riboflavin is another nice one. Riboflavin actually works on the, uh, on the uh, uh, inside of the nerve. We call it the mitochondria, which is the, the generator, the energy generator. Uh, and it turns off this generator to certain sensitivities. The problem is B2 takes about six weeks to work. But it has no side effects, no drug interactions. Everybody loves it. There's no weight gain. Uh, it takes about six weeks to work. Then we have these rescue drugs. I talked about rescue before. Because what happens if you do everything right? You try to avoid the trigger, you get the migraine, you take a trip tan, it doesn't work, we're four hours into this, and uh, you're just disabled. Now, for any of you, and I, I know I can't show for, I can't ask for a raise of, a raise of hands here, but how do you like going to the emergency room uh, when you have a migraine headache? It's not a fun experience. You're sitting next to somebody from the uh, a local knife and gun, gun club that's just been shot. You got children screaming. You got bright lights. You got people running around everywhere. It's not a good place for a migraineur. Plus, you're asking, asking for asking for something for your headache. Uh, and you know, it's just a headache, right? Well, it's a disabling headache. But they're going to say, "Oh yeah, yeah. What do you want? Do you want a narcotic? Do you want an opioid for this? Yeah, just wait for a few minutes. We'll be there." So it's a miserable experience. Why not treat this at home? And we have several drugs here that we can use very effectively to turn off headache. One of them is called olanzapine. Olanzapine is also known as Zyprexa. Zyprexa is a drug that's FDA approved for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. But migraineurs are not crazy. My wife is, you're not. And what we do in this situation, if you have a really bad headache, we'll give you 10 milligrams of olanzapine. Olanzapine knocks you out. It makes you go to sleep. So what we tell the people that take the drug is this. Tell your family, mommy's got a really bad headache, can't take any more. I'm going to take the olanzapine. I'll see you in eight hours. Do not wake me up. Good luck making dinner tonight. Another drug is quetiapine, same as olanzapine. We can use either one of these. We have magnesium sulfate, which is uh, an uh, intravenous drug that we use in our office to stop the migraine in 10 seconds. I'll actually show you that. And then we have something called occipital nerve blocks. So the occipital nerve is a gateway to the trigeminal nerve. If we block this nerve, uh, with uh, a little Novocaine, a little cortisone, uh, then the pain goes away. It goes away very quickly. We could use this in pregnancy. We could use this in whiplash injuries. We could use it in acute migraine. It really is nice. All you got to do is inject uh, in the skin around the neck, and uh, the pain goes away within about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, this is IV magnesium. So I'm going to show you now, for those of you that do not believe me, how we can stop a migraine very quickly. Uh, this is not an actor, it's a real patient uh, who has severe migraines. She came in with a uh, headache that she rated as a 10 on a scale of 10, severe photophobia, which means she, she can't really see because the lights are so bright. Uh, she had taken Imitrex uh, prior to this, and she was just miserable. So what we do is we inject uh, magnesium, which is a very safe drug to use. I've been using it now for about 15 years. We've done it hundreds and hundreds of times, no problems. Uh, we put an IV in the arm. You can see her uh, uh, hand uh, covering her eyes, and we just inject as fast as we can. That's the magnesium. We inject it. 
and then listen. That's about 12 seconds, and the headache's gone. Yeah, so it's gone. Good, good job. You see, that's something that doctors can do uh, in their office. Uh, that usually was very cheap. We don't even charge for it uh, because uh, I mean, it's, it's like you know, 20 cents to give the injection, uh, and it makes people very, very happy. Then we have something called transform migraine. Uh, these are people that instead of having one or two headaches a month, they tend to have uh, headaches on a daily basis, more than 15 times a month. And these are very difficult headaches to manage. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that people get these uh, frequent headaches. Um, these, are, these are disabling headaches that occur on a daily basis. So one of them could be, acute uh, use of uh, analgesics on an overuse basis. So if, they, if they're treating themselves more than twice a week, they get frequent headaches. So they're using more than 24 pills a month, they're going to have these headaches. We see it in head and neck trauma. If people have been in a car accident, they're migraineurs, they're frequently going to transform into chronic daily headache. Uh, women get this more often than men. I, I rarely see men with this. People that use certain medications, birth control pills, all this can cause a transformation from intermittent migraine to everyday migraine. So what happens here, remember that I talked to you about the periactal Dr. Gray. If you use uh, medications more than twice a week, more than 24 pills a month, this is what happens. You can see the difference right over here. This is the periactal Dr. Gray. This is normal. And look at the scar tissue over here that occurs in these patients. So if you have structural damage in uh, the brains of these migraineurs, they cannot turn off the headache. So that's what happens physiologically. And I often show this picture to our transformed uh, patients and they get it. So they need to stop their medications. They need to focus on those behavioral interventions that I spoke about, getting enough sleep, eating meals, uh, uh, getting exercise, and so forth. We use steroids very commonly to help with the inflammation these patients are experiencing. We take them off all their medications, doesn't matter what it is. And some patients, uh, we need to help withdraw from the medications, but for the most part, we have to start fresh. We give nerve blocks, we give IV magnesium. We can give IV magnesium once a week if need be. Uh, but all this helps patients come out of this transformed migraine. And then what happens is within about two weeks, the patient gets better. So of having headaches every day, they could have four headaches a month, which is easily treated with uh, the medications that I mentioned before, the triptans, or we could even put them on preventative medication, which brings the headache frequency down even more. So in summary, migraineurs, uh, like most of the people on this call, are, are, are born with a very sensitive nervous system. We need to help them live within that sensitivity. How do we do that? Behavioral interventions, getting enough sleep, not skipping meals, exercising, being treated appropriately for the headaches and not overusing medications at all. Uh, we need to be able to diagnose migraineurs. Only about 20% of migraineurs are actually acutely or accurately, accurately diagnosed. So you cannot treat anything in medicine unless you make an accurate diagnosis. I mean, if somebody comes in and they have very bad headaches, and you say, well, you have appendicitis, uh, and you treat the appendicitis, their headaches are not going to get better if they really have migraine. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'd like to finish with is that for those of you that think you have sinus headaches, you don't. That's just activation of the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. There are many drugs that we can use safely and effectively for migraine. Uh, we, can, we can prevent it. We can treat it acutely. We can abort it. Uh, so uh, the treatment of migraine right now is very uh, easy for those of us that are in the field. Uh, the, the trick is getting the right diagnosis, behavioral invention, and finding the right type of treatment that will help everybody out. So with that, I want to thank you very much. And Eric, I'll be happy to field any questions that you guys might have. Thank you. Um, that was great. I just I, One question right now, I'll give everyone a chance to submit anything if they have any. Uh, one question I had is uh, kind of, you, you said that they're recurrent, disabling, and then at the, at the very beginning you talked about um, maybe some struggles at work, and I was wondering if you had any advice for kind of communicating um, some of the, some of your message of the disabling nature of migraine with employees and or with employers, and um, maybe finding the best way to to handle these uh, to handle migraine at work. 
Yeah, migrant work is, uh, is very common. And uh, uh, in, in our experience, in my, there, there's this uh, situation, it's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, which essentially says that patients or people cannot be hired, fired, promoted, demoted uh, due to a medical illness. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, what we try to uh, tell people to do is uh, learn how to uh, deal with the migraines appropriately. And that is minimizing the risk of uh, overuse of medications, learn to recognize the program so that you can treat that and advance the headache and you don't miss work. If you're missing a lot of work, that usually means that you're not being treated appropriately. Uh, there are many drugs that we can use to uh, have patients with headaches function very well at work. Uh, and I, I have never seen a case where, uh, Eric, where, where a patient was fired uh, because of migraines. I think people understand the nature of these headaches, and they're, they're just going to say, you know, go to your doctor, get the best treatment for this. And remember, there's many, many things that we can do in the field of headache to, to help these people out. Great. Uh, Emily asks, uh, in some of your expertise uh, with, with, with diabetes as well, um, is there a relationship between diabetes and migraine? And if, and if so, are there any particular treatments? So that, uh, it's interesting you asked that, uh, Eric, because I know you had asked me to give a talk on the relationship between diabetes and migraine. There's no significant relationship between the two. However, when people become hypoglycemic, when their blood sugar drops uh, very low, one of the symptoms is, is headache, but it's not migraine. It can trigger a migraine if you're a migraineur, uh, but uh, low blood sugar could be a trigger uh, for headaches, and the treatment for that in that case would be to prevent the migraine from occurring in the first place and prevent the hypoglycemia. Another question. This one kind of centers, uh, looks at, at Botox. Uh, David asked, my neurologist suggested Botox treatments if I get more than 15 headaches a month. Uh, I'm just under that number. What is the effectiveness of Botox? Yeah, Botox is a really good uh, way that we could, I didn't uh, discuss Botox on purpose here. Botox is, uh, is approved for chronic migraine, which means 15 headaches a month or more. And it is now, uh, uh, I guess most insurances are covering that for this indication. Uh, we use uh, quite a bit of Botox uh, and uh, works very well. Uh, the trick is to find a headache specialist or what we call an injector, somebody that does Botox injection, injections because this is not really for cosmetic use. Eric, what we have to do is give the injection in, in predefined uh, spots in the uh, forehead, side of the head, and neck. When we do this, the headaches improve by at least 50% in the vast majority of, of patients. So in answer to the question, you're going to see a decrease in frequency, intensity, and duration of these migraines, usually within five days of giving Botox. The issue with Botox is it wears off. After three months, headaches are back, so you've got to do it again every three months. So um, uh, what we'll do commonly is with our Botox patients, uh, every year we'll reevaluate. If the patient wants to try to stop the Botox, we can do it. Uh, but then if the headaches reoccur, then we just start the Botox once again. Great. Uh, the last question we have is... Uh, um, um, one of our, our viewers, he's asking about the use of caffeine to treat migraines. You, you kind of touched on it. Was one, he was wondering if you can go into a little bit more detail. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, I, liked, I liked that question. Uh, we had a patient yesterday, because uh, I do um, a concierge medicine, some of our patients are in different states, sometimes different countries, and they call. Somebody was having a, a very bad migraine and uh, was on a train and didn't have her medicine and said, just go get a couple of cups of coffee. Uh, and caffeine, it worked, uh, but caffeine does work very well uh, in uh, reducing headaches. In fact, for those of you that have ever taken Excedrin, guess what it has in there? Caffeine. That uh, I believe 65 milligrams of caffeine, uh, which is about a quarter cup of coffee. It's got Tylenol. It's got aspirin in it. So we know that caffeine works. The other thing that it does besides take care of pain is it actually increases the uh, rate of gastric emptying. So the stomach empties faster when you're on caffeine. So if you're taking a pill for acute migraine and you use caffeine with it, the pill will probably work a little bit faster because otherwise the medicine may take uh, several, uh, maybe an hour or two to even kick in. With caffeine, it goes down, it, it gets better a little bit quickly. So if in doubt, uh, if all things come, uh, come down, what am I supposed to do? i got nothing here. Go to 7-Eleven and get one of those uh, huge uh, carrier jugs of caffeine and chug it down slowly, and you should be okay. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Under, for your time and this uh, very informative presentation. Uh, all our attendees, thank you, uh, thank you very much as well for joining us.
Um, I, if you come up with any questions afterwards, feel free to uh, to, to go to our website, headaches.org. We have a little section on there where you can submit questions, and we can talk to Dr. Unger or any other of our kind of headache care provider members, and, and, and maybe get you and get you some uh, get you some answers. So, um, feel if you didn't get your question answered today, feel free to come to our website. Um, once again, thanks thanks again, Dr. Unger, and uh, thanks everyone for for joining us.